Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, still wrapped in a pandemic heating planet, as we all know now as well, and a very turbulent one. Uh, we are on a planet with a dynamic surface that is in motion, and those under subterranean motions can uh, be violent. Uh, right now, you're looking at yesterday's um, GOES 16 satellite imagery of the latest puff. Actually, there's one today, so that's not the latest. That's the latest emission of uh, from a violent eruption underway in St. Vincent and Grenadines, uh, one of many volcanoes with the name Soufrier, which I believe derives from sulfur. And um, it looks from space kind of abstract. And, you know, you look at it, and you say, oh, wow, you know, we live on a cool planet with lots of volcanoes. When you're on the surface, this is hugely consequential, of course. Um, this is an arena. This part of the Caribbean is uh, violent um, and has a history of violence, as do the Ring of Fire around the Pacific from all the way from Seattle and Oregon back through Indonesia. So there again is the volcano we're going to talk about this morning initially, but then we're going to branch out and talk about this kind of risk everywhere. And what do we do about it at the interface of science and society? What can we do better, including with the media? Uh, so today you have some great guests who are a mix of volcanologists. Uh, uh, we have Deborah Brosnan, who's uh, Irish born, a disaster risk uh, expert who started in a career in marine biology, but was in Montserrat in the Caribbean in the mid nineties when that island had its extremely violent eruptions that have ended much of what was there. Uh, until then, uh, still trying to figure out what the future of Montserrat will be. Uh, we have uh, Enot Lav from the Earth Institute at Columbia University, the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, who has studied volcanoes from Hawaii and elsewhere. And um, we have um, Jenny Barkley, who will, who is here today with us to discuss her experiences, who had been in the Caribbean for a very long time, and also looks at this interface of um, scientific information and and uh, what communities can and can't do uh, living around volcanoes. In fact, the concept of managed retreat, which I've written about in the context of global warming, if anything is more uh, more vivid when you think about uh, volcanology and the, the sort of that dynamic, there's the questions right now is we'll explore whether much of um, the northern part of the island of uh, St. Vincent may essentially be history for humans, at least for a long time to come. So good morning, everyone. And oh, and Henry Fountain is with us, my my old friend from the New York Times, a longtime science writer who's beat lately is, is climate increasingly, but who has written a lot about earthquake risk, and um, as have I in the past. And uh, Henry wrote a great book on the uh, the Great Alaskan Earthquake of 1964, and what science has learned from that jolt, uh, which created all kinds of havoc. So good morning to you all. You can unmute and. Uh, and folks can get to know you a little bit. Um, and I, I thought we'd start with uh, Deborah because you're in the Caribbean, you're in Antigua, mm -hmm. and maybe just describe a little bit how, di how distant you are from uh, St. Vincent. And I think you said there's a bit of a forecast uh, impact for you there. Yeah, I'm about 280 miles from the eruption right now in Antigua, um, which is probably a little more than the distance between New York and DC or New York and Boston. So relatively close as the crow flies. And because the eruption has become so, so explosive, so violent, a lot of that ash, as we saw in your imagery, is going way up in the air. And when it gets up to a certain level, it gets up into different winds. And so those winds carry it over a broad, much broader area of the Caribbean. So we are expecting an ash fall in about anywhere up to about 12 hours. They're telling us that to expect some initial ash coming in. Uh, for us, that means if anybody here, just to get practical for a second, if we start to get that ash fall, you cover anything with water, definitely close your windows. It's very fine. It's powdery. It's not good to breathe in. Um, and hopefully we will get very light dusting and it will it'll move along. But anyway, but this is, um, this is where I am. And just looking at the eruption, it really does remind me of the time, and Jenny was there with me too, when we were working on the, on the Sufi Air Volcano in Montserrat, the same kind of continuing escalating volcano, the same uncertainties, the same scrambling of signs to really understand what's happening, and then to communicate to decision makers what to do, because you have to make decisions. 
So let's talk briefly about uh, Montserrat because that was historic, something that had happened. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, at least for now. And uh, maybe Jenny, you want to come into the, uh, the discussion here and uh, University of East Anglia. Um, so what was going on there in the 90s? Why, why were you both there? And uh, what was it like to have that unfold? So uh, I guess, yeah, I first met Deborah, I think, in 1996. So this is just after I'd finished my uh, PhD. And um, basically, uh, La Soufrière Hills volcano, which is the name of the volcano on Montserrat, uh, had signs of unrest, and then it started to erupt. And like Deborah said, these are both very characteristic of these sorts of volcanoes, both worldwide and in the Caribbean, where they erupt a type of magma that is capable of erupting both uh, explosively and what we call passively, where they create lava domes. And the real challenge there is kind of uh, understanding and forecasting what's going to happen. So effectively, mm -hmm. communities who live around those volcanoes have to deal with conditions of quite strong uncertainty. And you're prompting me there with some um, incredible footage from the Soufriere Hills volcano yeah. of yeah. Uh, pyroclastic flows or pyroclastic density currents, which are red hot flows of ash and gas and blocks which come roaring down the side of hills and pretty much destroy everything that's in their path and that's oh, something that La Soufrière St Vincent has started uh, generating um, in the last few days as well so they can do these nice passive uh, slowly growing domes but then also they have this uh, real propensity for pressurization explosion and then also generating these kind of red hot currents and that's what was going on this is what's going on uh, at Soufriere Hills volcano and one of the real challenges with the small islands in the Caribbean is of course having populations who live in close proximity to these hazards. Yeah I, I, I was at a conference a couple of years ago in Mexico City uh, called Understanding Risk it was World yeah. Bank and others, and maybe some of you were there. Um, and I ran a discussion of volcanoes and communication and risk. And Renato Soledum from Philippines was there. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked him, you know, so how do you communicate this? You have the uncertainty. You know, the ground can rumble and explode or not. It's you know, so many issues, time scale questions. And they not, I know you've dealt with this too. So I said, so how do you communicate this? And he, the first thing he said was, I say, I say to these communities, you just have to remember the volcano owns the land. Yeah. Just like that, the volcano yeah. owns the land. Of course, it created the land too. So uh, I don't know if that feels like a big yes when you think about how you do this or not. And maybe and not, you could bring, if you could come in here just briefly and just sort of describe sure. where you've worked and you know, what do you think about that, that issue? When you talk to people in these areas, yeah, that's um, communicating the risk is definitely an issue. I mean, on one hand, communities who live near volcanoes know where they live, and there's usually a long history of what has been going on. Um, but also, say, as opposed to maybe hurricanes or things that come every year, um, volcanoes erupt infrequently at one spot um, in some cases. And then you have to deal with people kind of forgetting what happened, you know, 40 years ago and not having a real sense of what it would mean. Um, it all starts to kind of sound like your grandma's tales. But so then you have to say, no, it's still really there and it could change every moment, every moment. And we don't actually know what it would do. You know, when you hear the rumble, you can say it might do something. We don't know exactly when. We don't know exactly what type. Um, a big uncertainty now is how long will something last? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have an answer for that scientifically yet. And that, that's and that's that's this issue of then how you build a trustworthy relationship with the community. Uh, right. Where you, if there's all these questions you can't answer. And but I think you, that's okay. Oh, sorry. I, I I think that's okay, Andy. That it, if you don't know, and I think the transfer. Like, it's really important for scientists that we do communicate that uncertainty and that we don't know the answer. But what we do know is that we have a lot of information about a volcano or that volcano, probably more than any other group, and that we're gathering more information. And the more information we have, the more we can communicate. And I think what's crucial to communicate is not even the certainty, but the uncertainty and the risks associated with that. So if we think 
a volcano or some other hazard is likely to escalate. And we say, I'm going to throw out a number, look, we think there's a 70% chance this is going to get worse. Um, but if it does get worse, here are the consequences because people will make decisions on the consequences. Evacuating people is not an easy task. It's certainly disruptive, it's traumatic for people and governments really want to know they're making the right decision. We saw the same in the pandemic, this sort of, do we need more certainty before we lock down or what happens to the economy? It's the same with volcanic eruptions. And I, as scientists, if we communicate our uncertainty, our risk, we can help decision makers balance those, balance those needs. Um, you know, obviously when the volcano is happening, there's not much, that, uh, it's get out as fast as you can, but ahead of time to make the decision as to when to get out is really important. So uncertainty is, uncertainty can be our friend. We have to live with it, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Jenny, I, I think. Yeah, I think coming back to the, the that point about the communities who live around the volcano. So in the, in the Caribbean in particular, some, the, the communities have quite a strong sense of the volcanic eruption. So particularly on an island like um, St. Vincent, uh, where uh, the volcano blows relatively frequently, uh, to, to use the wording that's in, the, uh, in your tweet there. Um, and one of the things I think that is really important in this context is, is sharing in that understanding together. And actually, uh, when I first arrived on Montserrat, I was a rock volcano scientist, which I still am. But I've actually subsequently, it's such a fascinating and urgent problem that I've done quite a lot of work on risk communication. And the trust in the scientists was a really key issue there, but also kind of making a community of trust around that. So kind of understanding and valuing the local knowledge, because certainly in the context you think about the Caribbean, you've already alluded to it, there's all sorts of other livelihood and risk challenges that they are taking into account. So kind of working within that context is really important. But as Deborah says, when there's an emergency, the key message is not very uncertain. It's just get out and stay out until um, <laughs> it settles back down. And now I want to bring in the role of the media. And again, Henry and I have been at this for a long time uh, in various contexts, climate, earthquakes, tsunami risk, which I wrote about when the Indian Ocean uh, tragedy happened. Uh, so Henry, mm. how, how does this work in your sense? And maybe you could just talk about old media versus what now, uh, you know, you've made the transition like I have to electronic sort of the instanet as some call it from the luxury of writing a daily story, having it published and is sure. the media part of the problem or part of the solution still overall? I'm not just talking about the times, but you know, your sense of like the big picture here when things like this are percolating. Uh, you know, it, I guess it's, you know, to, to weasel out of it, it kind of depends, but, uh, you know, I think, um, uh, more information, more accurate information is better all around. And, um, for instance, with this eruption, we had a story by a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, when it happened, that was really, um, detailed about what was going on and why, and, uh, the history of the place. Um, in my work, you know, I, I write about volcanoes occasionally, but I uh, write a lot about earthquakes and uh, other potential natural disasters. And, you know, I just feel the more people know the reasons why these things happen, the more trust they have in the science. And that translates to more trust in emergency authorities or whatever. So um, uh, whether, you know, uh, obviously you can get the information out a lot faster now, uh, which is, also all all good as long as people take the time to be accurate and uh you know realistic about about things and, and social media i think as yeah. is an incredibly important part of getting the word out and around now including directly from agencies and maybe uh, uh you guys can talk about that too you're yeah. the, all three of you are on twitter the, uh, the non-journalists here. So you've become communicators. Uh, right, right. And I think it's it's been kind of um, crazy the last couple, few weeks, you know, between um, uh, St. Vincent and Iceland and Guatemala and Pacaya and all these streams of information coming. And it's not just from news venues or the media, it's, it's directly from scientists on the ground. Like we can have a live feed from 
the scientists that in Cebu May in Guatemala going through the lava flow and checking it out. And it's just unfiltered, but it and raw, but it's also, I mean, this is people doing their job. And if that not doesn't give people trust, then I don't know what can. Right. So is there I think sorry? seeing that from um just I know we were reaching out to UWI, but you know, volcanologists on the ground are on the ground right now, but I will give full credit to that the team on the ground because I'm seeing a lot of communication about yes. the science. Yeah. Um, and Jenny, when we started it in Montserrat first, it was a real challenge to as to how much information should be given out, how it would happen. And credit to the scientists who said, no, we're gonna let people know what's happening. And that made a huge difference. That's not even a question today. The right. you know, at regular reports, regular updates, regular, hey, here's where, here's where to go, here's what to look for health issues, et cetera. I think they're coming out. So I do think the UWI seismic research team, has, you know, Jenny, you're part of that, um, deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, I'm not part of the, obviously, the monitoring agency itself, but I've worked with them a lot and their uh, communication processes are absolutely world class. And of course, they were strongly involved in the monitoring effort. They are the agency who monitors the Soufriere Hills volcano too. They're responsible for all of the volcanoes in the English speaking Caribbean, which is which is uh, quite a remit. And just mm -hmm. That constant information flow and in terms of kind of imagining what's going on with the volcano it's quite tricky and so the use there are use of visual media films mm -hmm. getting people from uh, the local community to talk about their own experience of risk mm -hmm. is is absolutely it's a, a textbook world-class case of great communication um, I wanted to ask about the story before the story um, this is an issue that I've been trying to get at here in my new role at Columbia including with the media, and it's how to do a better job of crystallizing awareness of risk before the event. And this was a 1995 paper, so a long time ago, not not unique, of course, on La Soufrier and the, the map of risk uh, on the island. And if you look right now at the red zone now, uh, it's kind of the same as was just identified in this paper. Um, and I just wonder if the media and or science can, what, what's the frontier for making sure, for example, that a development plan for an island is disincenting development in, in, a, in a volcano hot zone and putting it, incentivizing it in other places. This relates to wildfire, uh, quake zones and everything. Uh, I don't know whether, do you feel like we're adequately addressing this now? And maybe we could start with um, uh, with um, Deborah. And so you're talking about, are we addressing the fact of how do we, how do we stop people from, you know, being in harm's way? Or deliberately yeah. moving from there? Uh, I don't think we're addressing it well enough. I think one of the challenges right now is that we're in the midst of this eruption and right. people are being evacuated and Probably, if this continues the way it is, even already, many of those people will not get the chance to return home because, unfortunately, a lot of those places will be gone. Now is the time that we should be bringing in some help to the island to start thinking about how do you recover? Because right now the volcano is going to be on everybody's minds. Where do you, th where do you start to develop? Where do you start to put your critical infrastructure? Where do you... Where do you create communities for people who've been displaced and who need to and, and need to build new communities? Uh, I don't think that as a society we are very good at mitigating risks in terms of where people live, and particularly as our as our you know population is growing. But there's another reason for that too, which is the slopes of volcanoes are highly fertile. Right, so they're you, wonderful places. Yeah, if you want to have a good farm, you put it there. Uh, a lot of the coastal areas that ex experience extreme hurricanes and floods are also very fertile, it's where the best fisheries are. So there's a, a trade-off for humans to be in, in harm's way because that's where the most productivity is and then the harm that comes when something happens. But I think now, now is the time to start thinking about how do we create a safer and more resilient St. Vincent? And you know, the government's going to be focused on the volcano, but what kind of support can outside governments and others give to start that process now so that we don't end up in a crisis down the line when we're trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, actually, yeah. there's one angle, sorry, one angle of the story that I still haven't really seen covered 
and maybe it's because it's too soon. You know, Henry and I know the cycle of news is you deal with the thing that's happening and then you deal with the bigger implications and stuff. But mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, Deborah, you had mentioned to me that it's very unlikely that many of those people being evacuated will ever go back to that northern part of the island. Yes, if the volcano continues. And I don't know whether the others have, are tracking this well, but thousands of people who are being put on cruise ships taken to other islands are not going back. Well, I'm not sure about that. Well, so in, ter in terms of the um, historical record on the island, there was a very violent explosion in 1902. Obviously, that's a very long time ago. But the mm -hmm. population uh, wanted to return to the very north of the island um, really within a few months of almost complete devastation uh, uh, in that north of the island. And the, it is, was uh, repopulated. And again, drift back uh, because people want to go back to where they live. It was uh, quite marked during the much smaller 1979 eruption. Um, and we, we did a sort of global analysis of evacuations and fatalities uh, for volcanic eruptions worldwide. Mm. One of the things we found was that quite often fatalities happen uh, after a volcano has started erupting and during its long kind of tail phase where there's an awful lot uh, going on. Uh, it's, a, it's a different paper to this one. Oh, but, sorry, I wasn't that's sure. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, this is relevant to your multi-hazard uh, approach. Mm. And so basically kind of trying to balance out some of the things, some of the issues that people have with how to kind of get the basic needs, which is something that Deborah's gonna know all about that people need during a disaster met to kind of make it easier for them to stay uh, out of the zone initially. But I'm not so sure that I would want to make pronouncements about where and how and if uh, people in the North of St. Vincent will reoccupy. Yeah. Yeah. There's also I, I, Jenny, we don't, we don't know, we, we don't know if, if they'll go back or not. But if yeah. we look at what happened in Montserrat, for instance, and use that as a model, uh, the population dropped, I think, from eleven thousand oh, to four absolutely. and a half thousand. Yeah, no, I, and, 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 and never got to go home. To be very many, honest, and, also, and taking oh, care of those people, I, I think, is is critical. And absolutely. so we don't know whether people will go back. I agree with you. I can't say if people will go back or not. But if it happens that they don't. What are we doing to help people who are displaced and will need help so that That's so we don't have, have a repeat of what happened before? That's a really good point. And I think also um, uh, to be to be absolutely fair to you as well, in, in 1902 and 1979, you know, in terms of population, there's, there's a sense that people do migrate. So a really, really important thing, I think, regardless of where you think people are going to be, is to make sure that they've got the essentials that they need for living and a good um, uh, uh, a good uh, livelihood context where, wherever that is. So I, I completely agree with you there. And I, um, I there's also, yeah, yeah, there's also, you show the map of, you know, the high risk zone and the medium, the lower risk zones. And we have to think that there's also a consequence to that. Um, if you make an area defined as a higher risk, then that makes the land there cheap. And that means that people who are already, um, you know, maybe lower income or uh, disenfranchised communities are more likely to go there rather than the more expensive relatively areas. So then you end up kind of get, getting those inequalities um, bigger because you're driving the weaker population into the higher risk areas. And then the next time something, something happens, they're gonna get even weaker and even um, even more in, prob in trouble. So that has come up recently after Kilauea um, in 2018. There was a lot of population in that Pune area in Hazard Zone 1 and 2 on the Rift Zone that everybody knew it was going to erupt. Um, but the land was really cheap and people were, were drawn to that. And regardless of the question of if this specific same people come back or not, someone um, would be drawn to that area. So interesting. Yeah, uh, good point. I, I, this, this issue, uh, there's another aspect of this too, which is, uh, and I've written about this and Henry knows this from the climate coverage. There are just some places on the planet that are, um, as there was a historian of New Orleans, P Pierce Lewis, who I wrote about when New Orleans had its great, the flood after um, Katrina. And he called New Orleans impossible 
and inevitable. <laughs> Meaning kind of like what you were saying about volcanoes, you know, it's mm -hmm. fertile, it's got all these great magnetic pulls and it's impossible <laughs> because it's gonna blow. Um, and Henry, I, I didn't know if, when you think about how we handle stories, including at the times, I know it for me at least, it's always harder to write the, the forecasting story, the story as we were just describing in between the events. So what, how do you how do you deal with that? Or how do you think the media generally can fill in those well, stories? I mean, it's true. I mean, the media responds to, you know, things that happen. And uh, I mean, I've encountered, I'm sure you encountered this and I've encountered this many times. If you try to write a story that's like, well, what could happen? A lot of editors say, well, you know, it's just what could happen. I mean, I know. we want action. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the risks are so high. I mean, you know, St. Vincent's uh, population is it's not a huge place, um, but, uh, you know, the, the Seattle metropolitan area, which is a similar situation in that there's been encroachment toward Mount Rainier for years. There's suburbs of Tacoma and Seattle that are really at risk of um, I'm showing that right now, actually. Yeah, of, of you know, really bad mud flows. You know, they're, they're in areas that historically over the last 10,000 years have really bad uh, flows from Rainier. Right. And it doesn't even require like a full eruption because Rainier, as we know, is like, a, it's a pretty damaged piece of rock. Um, I'll bring that back in a second. I had it. So, yeah. okay. so for a place like the Times, you know, we could uh, we could very easily do a story that takes St. Vincent as an example and points out that, you know, as a New York Times reader, maybe, you know, it's a small island in the Caribbean, but, you know, there's big risks for millions of people, uh, even in the United States. So, oh, sure. so that's one way I think, you know, and that's, that's a helpful story, I think. Maybe we'll do that. I hope we do. I don't know if I'll do it, but I hope we do it. I couldn't agree more. I keep clicking on the wrong button there. I'm sorry. I am my own producer here. So it's always a, uh... It's always a journey. A, a, um, I do want to show that again because it shows you exactly what you're talking about. That there were these geographers, um, Walker Ashley and um, Stephen Strader, who've been doing what they call expanding bullseye analysis. They look at the same area. They look at yeah. demographic change and hazard change. And almost always, it's the demographic and geographic change where people are settling that's moving fastest. And it's kind of like you see that as a scientist, it must drive you a little crazy. I know as, as a journalist covering these issues, it has driven me sometimes crazy too. Uh, here again, let's go to Seattle, 1940. Uh, the, the circles there are the maps of uh, risk from several of the volcanoes there. 1980, and they project forward. 2020, 2060, under projected development patterns. And that's housing density, basically. There's the scale, 2100. So we're building, we're building risk. We're building vulnerability and risk mm -hmm. in zones of inevitable hazard. But as, as, as Pierce Lewis said, it's kind of like how you make that gradient of decisions is really hard. So how, how do you all deal with that as, as knowing the sort of the geophysical realities, maybe Jenny and then Anad and Deborah? I guess it, it comes it comes back to that point. I think in terms of looking more widely forwards to um, uh, how we can deal better in the future, I think it's definitely coming uh, balancing relative and different risks. I mean, as Deborah said, the absolute duty of care is to make sure that people who are where something happens that is high impact are looked after and make sure that they can sustain their livelihoods and that basically there is opportunities for them either in the in the place where they wish to live or the place where they have to move. I think we will make significant advances once we start to think about multi hazards and start thinking about merging hazards which have high intensity, low return periods with current hazards as well and taking account of those and trying to find measures that can help with this where there's benefits uh, to justify the kind of cost that it takes to make that sort of um, assertion. So I think it's by working in a more holistic way and a more collaborative way, I think that we will uh, do better. And is that happening? <laughs> so um, it feels like it's getting really urgent 
that it needs to start happening because of course the context that we're experiencing with the impacts of um, a changing environment obviously are. So it is beginning to, I'm not sure if we're weighing up the costs and benefits sufficiently in the right way at the moment to be doing it fast enough. I don't know what you would, if you would agree with that, Deborah. Yeah, I, I really would, and, and all of what you've said there, I, I think multi-hazards, looking at it from a multi-hazard approach is essential. Otherwise you go from one crisis to the next. Yeah. Um, and the other, this the cost benefit, we're not, I, I, I tend to agree with you, I'm not sure that we're looking at it in the right way. And the, the investment in, the upfront investment that will actually create huge benefits, there's still a reluctance to look at, it's still, there's still a reluctance to see that as a benefit. It's still almost seen as a cost whether it is in doing nature-based solutions or building resilience to climate change, extreme events, or volcanic events, even though the, the models show that you, you recoup more than you invest, there's still a, there's still a reluct reluctance. We're still fighting an uphill battle on that, I feel. I certainly feel the same way. And, and Henry, your beat is climate yeah. largely now, right? And uh, you, you know, there's been a lot of press coverage a lot more the new Biden administration is very focused on it but when you look at the actual trajectories for where it has to happen to cut emissions and you look at the vulnerability I just was in a Twitter chat with Lisa Shipper this morning who's a climate uh, risk person and we're not even close to grappling with it even with what's happening now I don't know Henry what that sometimes feels like 20 years in. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you totally broke up. I had a problem with my signal. Oh, oh, oh. I, I was talking about the, oh yeah, you look a little, um, like there is a slow connection. I, I was talking about these kinds of stories where essentially you see this disconnect between the scientific information and the response in society. He'll come back. Um, and you're all just talking about that. I'm on the current UN disaster risk reduction authorship for a big, the next big report on, on disaster risk of the, the global assessment report. I'm helping to write the chapters yeah. on communication. And you look at the scholarship and you, it still feels like a frontier, like a grand challenge in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And it, I think science, also some of the scientists are trying to starting to really realize that there's so much more cross-cutting themes that we should all be thinking about. Um, I started talking between volcanologists and hurricane scientists and teaching a class about you know what do you do with disasters in general and how you prepare for all of them. And there's so much commonalities that we all should be thinking about together. Um, you know, because a resilience plan is going to impact the community, no matter if it's the next earthquake or if it's the next hurricane or it's the next volcano. And if you're in a Caribbean, you can kind of be subject to all of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's hard to think about. Risk. Yeah. Andy, I liked your idea of the phrase you use, grand challenge, you know, which about being on the frontier of having all the scientific knowledge and communicating it in a way that we actually start to change behaviors and drive action. Uh, I, I'm just thinking about it would be a, it would be a wonderful thing to take up. Um, you know, we get funding for all of these wicked problems and grand challenges, but this is a really wicked problem and it could be a grand challenge. So I'm not quite sure how to turn it into that, but I well, do I, think it's urgent in a, in a global issue. I, I do too. Henry, it's good to have you back. Sorry about the internet issues. Um, I, I think the, um, one reality I've noticed in the climate context that came out of one of the discussions I've recently led was that the amount of um, funding in social sciences related to climate is this tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the overall funding investment in climate science. And that feels like it's part of that undiscovered territory is that we're just not adequately dug in on that the sciences that are at that interface of data and decision feel like they're like enough attention. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's really interesting, isn't it, whether there's a um, 
uh, whether there's a feedback uh, between the decision makers and their expectation for certainty that can be produced in their head via physical sciences. And actually, I, for me, I think with dynamic situations like this, it's actually the collaboration between the two that has the richest territory in terms of the grand challenge. Because if you think about the physical phenomena, so obviously drawing on my experience as a volcanologist, you know, what an eruption does changes the landscape. So if you have exactly the same eruption the next time, it's going to create different impacts. So kind of taking an overall impact-based approach to the science is really helpful, but it actually means that socially the situation is really dynamic too. So you imagine the social and cultural situation on St. Vincent this week versus what it was this time last week. It's, it's obviously moved on. So it's thinking of the two is dynamic, but also actually it's something that do interact with one another. There is a consequence, and particularly when you start to think about the extra challenges of climate change, it's in that it's in that integration that I see. It's not a zero sum game with social and physical science. Well, and, and I know that you and, for example, at Terry Plank, who you work with so much, um, there is work to be done in actually clarifying the potential to forecast more effectively, right? Yeah, yeah, so there's even it's just not, on the not, science. It's not, it's not like we just focus on the social science. There actually is science that can actually right. potentially improve our forecasting and the like. Yeah, definitely. So we, with the science, we still definitely have some open questions on what um, the signals might be that we should be looking for and what they might mean. And uh, we're getting better at it, but for a lot of places, we are just um, kind of striving for more data because um, there's kind of all these lab volcanoes that have been studied for a long time and in a lot of detail, but there's so many volcanoes that um, we just haven't really looked at. And we're kind of like looking for the answer under the, the lamppost, but it might be um, a little away from it. So the idea of getting a much more global view of what volcanoes do, even not those that are going to erupt for sure within an NSF funding round, um, so, yeah, so it, we're getting, and also trying to, within our community of scientists, get the communication better in the sense that we don't all go with our specialized instrument on whenever we get to go, but working on a multi-parameter approach so that all those pieces work together. So the seismology and the chemistry of the gases and the rocks coming out, they all get looked at together at the same time. Um, and we're pretty sure that the answer is going to be much more clear once we start doing that in more places. And this gets back to what Jenny was saying, I think it was Jenny just now, about the landscape is different after a volcano. But I guess all around the world, every volcano is different as well. So you, it must be hard to get a sense of oh, now we have a standardized thing. We can just deploy it here, there, and everywhere and have better forecasting. Right. So it's a challenge. Yeah, I think that's where scientists like Ina are so um, uh, uh, important because they can recognize the commonalities between processes across systems. And then once you're starting to kind of do that, you're kind of doing things more efficiently um, uh, and, and effectively in terms of un understanding them. But also the absolute... In the key key thing of the volcano monitoring scientists so those who are in the agencies who are providing real-time information and talking to those the experiences that they have of dealing with that and working with uncertainty are absolutely at the heart of this and this is something that we as volcanologists should really value that experience that they have in kind of crossing across that interface and, and the insights that that brings them yeah. so is this uh I know I had heard about this project, uh, uh, Avert, uh, anticipating mm -hmm. volcanic eruptions in real time. This is this is underway now, right? This is is it just getting underway? This is sort of a been. In the works? Yeah, we just entered our second year, but we really practically on our first year because last summer's uh, fieldwork all got uh, delayed by COVID. So this summer we're gearing up towards an, our very first installation. Um, it's going to be a site up in uh, Cleveland Volcano in the Aleutians in Alaska. And we're trying to put in one spot both the geophysics, the seismometers, the GPS sensors, um, and the gas sensors, as well as the cameras to look at what's going on with the plume. 
and monitor this whole thing in real time through a satellite link. So we don't rely on sometimes fragile radio links. Um, and that would be the first site out of uh, probably around 20 on Cleveland Volcano and Okmok Volcano. And we targeted these two because they behave quite differently. Um, and we're hoping to kind of have these two typecasts that maybe we can then expand our vision to similar systems in other places. So that's, boy, that's a very, that's like a kid's drawing of a volcano. <laughs> right, right. So that, yeah, that, uh, that, we're that. trying to engineer this system so that it's it's very low power and relatively low cost so that if it works, um, and we hope it will, um, it can be deployed fairly similarly in other places um, Interesting. And around the world. So this is kind of like a prototype. Is this, um, is this sort of real-time multi-dimensional monitoring this is really just this sort of a new thing is there and been earlier attempts at this there have been attempts um but they've been somewhat limited in terms of the extent i mean there's you know a volcano like etna there's data streaming out all the time and of all these different types of instruments and there's some volcanoes that are like that but sometimes the data is not shared widely or is it it's shared in pieces? Um, so you have to go to this website for the seismic, to go to that website for the gas, if it's even being shared. Oh, right. um, so we're trying to really make it um, much more organized and accessible so people can see things um, as quickly as they are becoming available. That's great. What's the, um, I know there are some websites like the, the Smithsonian one I just showed that are kind of a home base for tracking yeah. Volcanic activity. Is that is that the best example of a ground sort of a place that's sort of a, a hub for this or are there others? Um, yeah, there's been some global organizing kind of attempts to organizing data. There's places that provide um, satellite data for sulfur emissions. There's places where you can get real time seismic data. Um, there's been all sorts of attempts and we're trying to at least our project is going to connect with the Smithsonian so that there's at least links to the data portal that you can download, but we're really trying to make it easier. So let's take this back. We'll close out the next few minutes uh, going back to the Caribbean. Uh, so Jenny, when you think about what's going you're monitoring pretty carefully right with through colleagues there i i know we were hoping to get someone from uwi on here today but of course they're they're doing the real work of monitoring this carefully so jenny what's the uh, main issue or opportunity that needs to be really dug in on here like if people in the outside world wanted to help out or like that's another question well, I, I think the absolute key one is what Deborah alluded to, which is the fact that for many months to come, there's going to be substantial support needed for those people who've had substantial damage that's happened in the north of the island as a result of the activity that's already happened. So what happened over Friday through to Sunday was there was a series of large explosions that created huge amounts of ash across the whole island. And of course, it's making its way to Deborah as we speak as well. Um, and then there was these pyroclastic density currents that came down the sides of the volcano. At the moment, uh, the explosions are getting further apart um, and um, they're getting slightly smaller. But obviously what we need to do is keep monitoring. So exactly the kinds of stuff as was just equipment as, as was just being discussed is need is needed to anticipate. And I know what's happening in the build up to each of these explosions. They're seeing subsurface earthquakes, which are an expression of that kind of pressurization process that's happening. So it's absolutely important in the very short term that we can provide as much support as possible as we can to our colleagues as they continue to work so hard monitoring the volcano and managing the population. But the really important thing and an interesting challenge, I think, um, for you and Henry, is how do we keep the world's attention on this once the explosions have stopped? because right. that's when the really, really hard challenges are going to happen socially, as Deborah was talking about earlier. I wanted to play something here briefly that really struck me the other day. It was the um, prime minister on uh, St. Vincent um, 
was talking about the Caribbean culture of care here. Well, this, this should work, so hold on a second. I must tell you. Ordinary people. Of Antigua. have responded to put people in their homes, strangers, bring tears to my eyes. I love this Caribbean. I just thought that was, um, I don't know how much that's um, reflective of a Caribbean ethos or um, generally in areas at risk like this, uh, Indonesia, Sumatra, Java. Um, um, obviously the external world can do more, but uh, it seems that there is a propensity in some of these places for care. I don't know, maybe Deborah and, and Jenny, and then Anat, where have you worked? I think I, I think he, what he's saying is true. There is a general sense of care. And I don't know if that's because for a long time the Caribbean was isolated and communities were going through a lot of these disasters, regular hurricanes, occasional uh, volcanic eruptions. But these kind of disasters really made the community stronger because you tend to rely on each other more. You have to. Uh, and I think that sense of care does extend throughout the whole the whole region. As he just said, Antigua came up and said, yes, we will take, I, I don't know if it's 500 immediately. Um, and nations are stepping up. And it is, it's really heartening to see that and, and to see it extend across different nations because they are different nations. But I find in communities in general, when these events happen, that people do show up, they show up for each other. And, and the important thing is to find ways to extend that sense of caring after the crisis has passed. Right, just just what Jenny said too. And Enad, you've worked in enough places around the world. Uh, this general propensity is for us to go into um, amnesia mode or to focus on the next thing. Right. Is that is that a real challenge? It is, um, but and it, it's important to keep working on things and keep thinking about it and not just forget about these people once it's the news cycle ended. Um, it's also really important to kind of develop the skills and the confidence within the, the communities themselves rather than you know writing in as you know the saviors and doing something major and grand and then moving right. away without leaving that kind of um root grassroots level of this is how we build ourselves back up so empowering local communities yeah. distrib distributed capacity right for that reminds me of Suzanne Moser, who works in climate resilience. Um, she had been at Columbia for our managed retreat meeting a year, whenever that was, two years ago. And she talks about the importance at the local level and in a distributed way to build the capacity, to build sort of an adaptive mind to make sure that the responders and communities, especially in places that face chronic or compound risk, are, are, are adaptable and resilient but to do it in a distributed way. That capacity feels really important going forward. And we're sort of toward the end here. So maybe a last thought. From think, and if I can just follow up on that, I, I think yeah. we have a, a capability just from what Ian was saying as well, that I, I actually think that base, that base capacity exists. And certainly like we were talking about in the Caribbean communities because they've been through so much. And I, I do like the idea of saying, don't just come in you know, the knight in shining armor, whatever, to offer support, but come in to be able to figure out what's there already and leverage that and build on it. Yeah. And I think that's, that is a, a, a model that could apply not just to the Caribbean, but generally yeah. to actually take the time and figure out what is the glue that holds this community together and how do you protect that and then support it. And often we don't, we don't, we don't take the time. We just come in and, you know, as society, we come in to help. 
Right. And I think that this is relevant to the Biden administration in terms of when they think about resilience and uh, uh, build back better initiatives that, mm -hmm. and also immigration, you know, where you're focusing so, so much on the border, but if you're not making countries more resilient and adaptable at home, Guatemala, great example, mm -hmm. earthquakes, climate, political disruption, then people will be yeah. dislocated and on the move. And so it makes sense for the, for the developed countries of the world to put more into that stuff too, I feel. Well, this has been a great, uh, you know, discussion. I hope maybe we can re reconvene to see how this has play plays out in the coming weeks. Um, it's great to have you on. I haven't done a session on volcanoes, although I've been thinking about it ever since that meeting I was at when um, uh, Renato Soldo said <laughs> the volcanoes on the land. It just really stuck with me. Yeah. And um, so that's that's it. That's a wrap for today's show. Thank you for being here. Uh, and for not, Thank you, Andy. And not love at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Good luck with that project. Uh, and by the way, we should absolutely do. If you can get any kind of a live signal out of the Aleutian yeah. this summer, we should do something from there. Yeah, that'd and, be cool. And Jenny, I'd love to keep track of the work you're doing, especially like that paper you described on the general issues around volcanoes and dislocation and settlement. And and Deborah, you've already been on here at least three times, I think. So you're welcome yeah. anytime. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so, so this is uh, Sustain Thanks. What? This is Sustain What? It's a um, multi, most several days a week uh, exploration of ways to pathways toward progress, mainly involving communication. I'm Andy Revkin at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Today's show was, uh, like all of them, is brought to you thanks to the Earth Institute's support for um, my initiative on communication and sustainability. To get in touch uh, to, to, for feedback on this show or f ideas for future ones, look at that distracting scrolling bar at the bottom. And um, I can put you in touch with these uh, great experts uh, if you need to, to as well. So wherever you are, uh, try to foster resilience in yourself and others. Stay safe in this pandemic and otherwise. And I think about the future a little bit every day, but not too much so that it paralyzes you. And again, get, get in touch with me anytime. This is Andy Revkin, and that's it. That's all for today's show. <laughs>